Welcome this morning. It's great to see you at church, as the church this morning. And um, if you are not physically at, at the service this morning, I want to say we're looking forward to seeing you soon in this place together with us because we are missing you. Is that right? So if you haven't yet managed to come and uh, you are still coming, we are waiting for you because we're going to be cheering you on. Now, maybe you can't come for a reason because you're somewhere else. And I, I know we've got some people watching us from, from other provinces. And so we want to also greet you. Uh, even if you're a member of our church and you're still watching, we really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you for being part this morning of this great service. I believe it's going to be a great time in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And, um, and we, you are most welcome. Now, if you maybe join in later on to the service, you don't really know us. You come, somebody shared this message and you hear it for the first time. I want to say welcome to you as well. Uh, there's a reason you're watching. God knows your life and he's got a plan for your life. And so it's not by chance this morning that you may be here and listening or in part of the service, even if it's through a message that you're listening on one of the platforms. Now, we have been sharing, if you know or don't know, I want to just encourage you. God gave us a theme last year already, but we started sharing it this year, a called, I think it was called Each One, Reach One, and Teach One. Do you remember that? And, uh, you know, many years ago, when we wanted to carry out the Great Commission, when our fa fathers told us and our grandfathers, we need to preach the gospel, we need to go out, we need to do something for God, it was very daunting because we had to go to foreign countries, we had to get on a train if we were in Europe or somewhere we could drive a train, we used to get on a ship maybe, some people were, could only go on a ship and then others could fly, you had to fly there and then you had to make your way there so that you can uh, represent God in some way. And there's nothing wrong with those things. Let me tell you, people are still doing them, and I, I respect them, and that's awesome. But I, I really feel, especially during this time when everything was on lockdown, when we couldn't really move like we always wanted to, it's incredible that God has raised up a platform. It's God's platform. Trust me, the enemy has polluted it. But God gave innovation. All innovation, good things come from God. And he invented, I believe, digital forms of media so that we could preach the gospel. And so each one, wherever you are this morning, in our community here, maybe outside of our community, you can use some message and you can reach one and teach one through that message. Each one of us can reach one and teach one. Isn't that amazing? Even from our homes, from our offices, from this church. So I want to encourage you, if you're not part of that, become part of it. It's going to become, it's going to become a movement of God where we're going to each one reach one and teach one through our message, our personal message. Now I'm going to come a little bit later to you. What is that personal message, Jack, that you're talking about that I have, that I can reach one and teach one? I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I want to say that if you want to, if maybe you're not physically part of our church, and as Newton said earlier on, but you'd like to be part of us, WhatsApp us, give us your name or your email, and we will keep you informed about what we are doing in this church. So even although you're not physically a member here, you can still be a member, you can still be part of this church, because God is going digital. God is not limited to an airplane because they grounded them, you know that. Or they've gone out of fashion or they've gone out of business because of economics. God can find another vessel and vehicle to preach his word in our lives. Isn't that wonderful? God's not shut down because of the coronavirus. God is very much alive. So I want to encourage you to be part of it. Now, if you've been listening to our services, and if you haven't, I'm going to just give you a quick refresher. We've been sharing this uh, last couple of weeks through various speakers, very anointed people. So if you haven't learned them, go onto the website, go onto the platform, and go and listen to the various speakers that have spoken about our theme, which is calling in the harvest. It's a great theme because I believe there's a great harvest out there, and we need to call it in. Amen. So we've been speaking about calling in the harvest now for a couple of weeks. And uh, you may ask, if you hear that uh, message this morning, you may ask, Jack, tell me now, does God have a harvest for me? That's a good question. I want you to write it there. If you are making a comment, you're allowed to make a comment. Even here, you may allow to make a comment. But if you want to leave it on, on, the, on our platform, you can. 
Does God have a, a, a harvest for me? Does God have a harvest for you? That's a good question because if we're saying we need to call in the harvest, how do I know I've got a harvest? And what am I calling in? Because I don't want to just call in stuff if I don't know what I'm calling in. So that's a very good question which I'd like to answer for you this morning if I may. But I would like to start, if I could, with a scripture in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. You may have read this long ago. It's not the well, most well-known scripture, but it is a very profound scripture. It says, as long as the earth endures. How many of you know that people are saying the earth is, we're coming to the end of the world? Did you, have you heard that before? But the earth is still enduring. You know why I know that's true? You're still here. I worry about the people at home because I can't see them. But I know there's still people here, so I know that the earth is still enduring. And if that's true, then it says, seed time and harvest time, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Seed time and harvest will never cease as long as the earth endures. Now, that's a promise. You know who gave us that promise in Genesis? God. Even when we feel like the earth is not enduring and nothing's happening, God says, listen, while it is still enduring, remember there's seed time and there is harvest. So we've been calling, speaking about calling in the harvest. Now, one of the things I want to remind you of, you cannot have a harvest without a seed. That's just natural. That's just things they teach us in biology, in life. You need a seed to have a harvest. So now, when we speak about a harvest, I want to encourage you to do something this morning for me. I want you to see your harvest, because you're asking the question with me, is there a harvest for me today? What, has God got a harvest for you? I'm going to answer it in a while. But while we're asking the question, while you're thinking about the harvest, I want you to do something for me. I want you to see your harvest in your seed. Did you get that? When you sow your seed, I don't want you to see a seed. I want you to see a harvest. And that's a multiplication. So when, even before we call in our harvest, we need to believe that when we plant a seed, there will be a harvest. And we see that harvest in the seed. How do we see it? We see it by faith. We see it by, because God has promised it. We see it because we need it. We need a harvest in our lives. And if you need a harvest, then it's time this morning to, um, to call in that harvest. Now, when Jesus was here, he was a great example. When Jesus came, God so loved the world, the Bible said that he sent Jesus. Now, when Jesus came, he, God planted a seed on the earth so that he could believe for a harvest. Did you know that? And every one of us sitting here today and every one of us listening today is part of that harvest that God saw when he sent Jesus Christ his son. And when Jesus came and he walked on the earth, he started doing a phenomenal thing. He started sharing scripture. He started sharing the word of God. He started, he started doing stuff. And you know what happened? People started to follow him. You know, he was reaching one and teaching one and creating a harvest by, and the Bible says the 12 disciples eventually followed Jesus. You know, there were 12 disciples who followed Jesus initially. I know there were other people, but let's just, they were the first fruits of Jesus' harvest of what he spoke about with the 12 disciples. How do we know that they were part of the harvest? Because wherever Jesus went, these people seemed to turn up as well. They came along with Jesus. They were just ordinary people like you and I. The Bible says many of them were fishermen. They weren't exactly uh, educated to a point where they deserved something because of their stature. They were just ordinary people who followed Jesus, and they became the first fruits of the harvest that Jesus sowed, or God sowed in Jesus Christ. Now, when those disciples went out, we know now that's then, they changed the world. Those people changed the world. That seed that God sowed through Jesus and his teaching, he saw a harvest in them, and they literally changed the world. If you look back now, 12 disciples turned the world upside down, and one of them was a dud. We're going to get to him now. One of them backfired. One of them didn't work. One of them was broken. Now, that comes to my next question is, if 
Jesus was so great, if Jesus was so all-knowing, why did he choose one disciple, Judas Iscariot, and why did he choose him knowing that he was going to fail? And here's the answer. Did Jesus know? He probably did, yes. Why did he then choose Judas? Because God is a God, here's the answer, of equal opportunities for all. God gives us equal opportunities as people. Did God make a mistake when he chose Judas? No, not at all. You know who made the mistake? Was Judas. He failed to see that he had a great harvest in his life. He could have created a legacy for his children's children's children. He could have really gone on to change the world together with all the other disciples. But he made a choice, a wrong choice. He ate his seed instead of sowing his seed and seeing the harvest in the seed. And you know, for 30 coins of silver, Judas sold Jesus out. And because of that, he never ever reaped the harvest that Jesus gave him an opportunity to be part of. I'm saying that because just to encourage us this morning, just because one person fails does not mean that there isn't a harvest for me, that I can't get it right. Now, you know, you may think that it was harsh because the Bible says the end of Judas's life was basically he hung himself and his insides were spilt out into a field of blood it was called. He basically ended his life because he failed to see a harvest. All he saw was 30 uh, coins of silver. He sold out the Lord for money. And you know, it reminds me that we must never eat our seed. You know, sometimes I want to eat my seed because I'm hungry. Sometimes I, I want to eat it because it's instant. Uh, you know, it's like instant oats. You just add water and bang, you got a meal. You know, I don't want to go through planting and crying and weeping and then, you know, harvesting. I, I want to eat my food now. So sometimes it is easier to eat your seed, but it is destructive because there's no harvest when you eat your seed. You need to see your, your harvest in your seed. Don't sell your, your, your seed for instant gratification. See that God's got a harvest there. So if you've been planting and you've been planting, I want to encourage you. The harvest is coming. God's got the harvest. He is the one who promised the harvest. But don't stop sowing. Now, there's another scripture that's profound. I haven't got too many scriptures this morning. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. I just want to read the middle portion. It says, looking to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. But it then says an interesting thing. It says that, it, it says for he, speaking about Jesus, um, it says, who endured, uh, for the joy that was set before him, before him endured the cross. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Now we know Jesus went through turmoil. Jesus went through suffering for us. But when he was hanging there, what was he thinking? Have you ever thought about it? You know, sometimes when I go through difficult times, I think to myself, especially when I've done something stupid, and that happens occasionally, I'm sure not in your life, but in mine, and then I'm thinking, what were you thinking, Jack? Have you ever had that moment of reality happen to you? Nobody. Okay, just me. Maybe somebody at home is there, you're feeling, you can say, yes, Jack, we, we agree, we've had that moment of insanity, where we've just come and realized, what were we thinking? What was Jesus thinking when he was hanging on the cross, when he went through suffering, pain, and, 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 and separation from God? What was he thinking? This is what he was thinking. He was thinking about us, the harvest. For the joy that was set before him, the promise of a harvest, he saw us through the eyes of faith, and he said, for their sake, I'm going to endure this for the joy. We weren't a suffering to him. We, he had suffering, but we were the joy part of his suffering. When he hung there, he said, I've got a joy because I see the harvest in the seed that I'm sowing in my life. I see a harvest of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, millions of people coming to the kingdom of God, and because because of that joy of the harvest, Jesus endured the cross. Otherwise, he could have got off that cross. The Bible said, as a matter of fact, those around him mocked him and said, if you're so great, why don't you get off your cross? 
Why don't, you, why don't you come down from that cross and show us who you really are? And Jesus said, I can do that, but I choose not to because I see a harvest. I see my seed, and in my seed I see a harvest. And he was looking at us. He was looking at people. Because in God's eyes, I want to encourage you, people have always been the greatest harvest ever. And we should have a likewise mind when it comes to thinking about people as a harvest that Jesus was a forerunner for. Now, the Bible also said, I want to read another scripture if I may. Jesus was walking, and this is about you right now where we're living. Jesus was walking, and as he was walking, he said something to his disciples. He said, you guys have got a saying, and you can read it there in John 4 verse 35. You have a saying, and I'm just going to have a sip of water here. It's still four months until harvest. You have a saying that there's still four months. Why was this a saying? Because the Jews really looked forward to harvest time. Because it was singing, it was rejoicing, it was, it was feast time. So they, they knew the calendar. And he said, you are looking forward. You've got a saying, it's still four months until harvest. Almost to encourage you, don't worry, the winter's almost over. Have you ever said that to somebody? Just another two months and the winter's over. It's almost like sunshine is coming and we are looking forward to it. Jesus, they had that saying. And say, yes, this is what Jesus said. Now he said, I tell you, open your eyes, Jack. What was Jesus? When Jesus says, open your eyes, what does he mean? Don't be blind. Well, not necessarily physically that. But he was saying, there's something, Jack, you can't see. Can you say that with me this morning? If Jesus says, open your eyes, it means there's something I need to see. Say there's something I need to see. I want to see it. If God comes and he says, Jack, there's something you need to see. The first thing I say, what, Lord? What? What? What is it? What must I see? I want to see it. Help me. He says, open your eyes. And of course, he was speaking about their spiritual eyes. He said to them, open your eyes and look. (laughs) It's there. In other words, I'm not hiding anything from you. God says, open your eyes, it's there. It's a revelation. I want you to see this. It says, then he says, look at the fields. What about the fields, Lord? The fields, they are ripe for harvest. What was he saying? But I thought it's still four months till harvest. You know, that's what we all say. It's four months till half. Jesus said, yes, that, that's what you say. But look, I want to show you another picture now. And this picture is from heaven. This is a revelation. This is through the window of heaven. Look and look at the fields. Look at them. Yes, I'm looking. It's not four months, Jack. It is ripe when? Now, why did the, why did the Jewish people understand this this example, because they knew that if the fields were white unto harvest four months from now, you had a small window of opportunity to reap that harvest, otherwise too much rain and and things would destroy the harvest, so you couldn't just say, okay, we're going to wait for another. When the window was there, it was a short window, when the fields were ripe unto harvest, you had to go and call in that harvest, you had to reap that harvest. So Jesus was saying, you can't afford to wait for Four more months. You need to see the harvest is ready now. Do you get it? So when do you think people are ready to be brought into the kingdom of God? In four months' time, Jack, it's, we, we've got a prophecy. It's going to happen. No, no. Listen, open your eyes, Jesus says. The harvest is ready. Now, I want you to say to yourself, the harvest is ready now. Write it if you are on, uh, on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you're watching from. Say the harvest. Is, I want you to say the harvest is ready now because if you don't say it, it doesn't become real. And you think you've still got four months. But God is saying, open your eyes. The harvest is ready. Whose harvest? Your harvest. Remember, your, the question is, does God have a harvest for me, Jack? Uh, does God have a harvest for me? Uh, Does God have a harvest for you? The answer is we're going to get to it, but that's the harvest I'm speaking about. It's something that belongs to you. You need to know it is ripe now. If I'm young, I'm excited about that. 
Because when I was young, they said, just wait a little bit, your harvest is coming. You know, and when you're old, they say to you, no, your harvest is gone. And when you're middle, middle age, they say, no, you know, your harvest is like in between. It's almost like, when is this harvest, when I'm young, middle aged or old? Well, I'm glad to tell you the harvest is now. Whether you're young, middle aged or old, whatever that is. Or very old. God has got a harvest. And you need to see that this morning. I want to encourage you to call in the harvest. So Jesus said that to them. Now I'm going to come to the exciting thing. How do I call in my harvest? If there is a harvest for me, and I know it's now, because God said there's a window. He opened, he said, open your eyes. I'm showing you something. It's ripe now. This is harvest season. (laughs) I thought somebody would say, I'm so excited about that. Harvest season. I'm going to eat We're going to dance. We're going to celebrate. It's harvest season. Okay, somebody on on Facebook shout something. It's harvest season. Somebody on YouTube say, yes, we're going to feast. It's harvest season. It's not famine season. They're not going to understand why people just say, I'm not saying anything. It's not COVID season. It's harvest season. Amen. So what can I do, Jack? So I want to give you practical things that I do. Maybe other people do other things. It's quite possible. Uh, People are quite ingenious and and creative. I can only tell you what I do (laughs) to help you because I don't know anything else. So I'm going to share things that I do. Maybe you can do them and it'll help you. So let's start with the first one. They're very easy things to do. If you want to harvest, if you want to harvest, you need to plant the seed. Put it in the ground, brother. You can't, you can't flick it there into the heavens and say, okay, I hope you find Jesus' seed. I hope you find luck seed. I hope you find some moisture in the cloud seed. No, no, no. You have to put that seed in the ground. That's God's way of holding us accountable to say, you are a farmer. I've given you some ground. I've given you some, I want to give you a harvest. Put it in the, in the ground. The first thing a, a natural farmer will do, he'll plant it. How do we plant the seed? How do we plant the seed? We go and dig a hole. We put it in. We close the hole. We go to an effort to make an effort to do something that we believe in. Somebody says, I want to do something for God. I say, okay, I know what it means. It means E-F-F-O-R-T. I hope I spelled it right. Effort. Is that right? It means effort. We need to make an effort for God. Why? Because when he hung on the cross, And he was suffering. And he was separated from God, the Bible says, because you know why he was separated at that moment when he was on the cross? Because he took upon himself the sins of the world. Every sin that was committed, he took upon him. And God had to judge sin. He had to judge Jesus because sin was upon his life for us. And in that moment, he was separated. Never had it happened before in his history. And he was separated from God because God had to turn away from him because he was judging sin. And he made an effort. He didn't just say, well, while I'm here, well, just do this. He made an effort. And because he made an effort, I'm going to make an effort. Is that right? And also, I'm very selfish. I want a harvest. You know, God's just so amazing. I can't be like God and everything. But I don't think God was selfish. I think he was just visionary saying, I want a harvest. But he made an effort. I want us to make an effort. You need to plant it. Now, if you can't plant it, don't claim it. Because then you're stealing. If it's my planting, I planted this and you come and take my my harvest. uh, Hey, that's stealing. Listen, plant your own seed. Why? I'll tell you why in a moment. Because there's no, God has given us all seeds to plant. That's the wonderful thing. Now plant it. The second thing is water it. Now there is this erroneous teaching, and I want to just correct you now. (laughs) So people say no, you know, they they quote this scripture in, uh, I think it's, Paul in Corinthians somewhere, he says that, you know, I have planted Paul, uh, Apollos is watered, and God gives the increase. And so they take it totally out of context. There's a very much reason why Paul wrote that. They take it out of context because there was a dispute. But what they, then people say, no, no, all I do is I just, I just plant, and I take my hands off, and I say, God, it's your problem now. No, that's not true. 
That's not true. That was only in the context of what Paul was writing about a dispute between disciples. The, the real thing is when I've planted that seed, I'm responsible for it because the Bible says I'm a co-laborer with Christ. In other words, he's working together with me, which means this is a 100% partnership. I can't just say to God, you do it. So when I, I plant it, I can't say, God, you water it. He said, no, you water it. It's your seed. How do I water the seed that's in the ground? I'm glad you asked that because this is probably a critical, critical thing. You have to speak over that seed. You know what the Bible says? The words, our words is like water. You know, the word of God is like water. It, we have to, you know what really causes seed to grow is water and heat. We need to, uh, we're going to bring the heat and we're going to bring the water. We're going, to, we're going to speak that word. We're going to say, you're going to grow into a mighty harvest, you seed. You get out of your lazy bum and you go work for Jesus and you bring me in a harvest. God's not offended by that. Speak to that seed. Speak and say, I give you life. I, I prophesy over you. You're going to have fountains and fountains and fountains in you. You're going to bring harvest to me. Or you could say, Imagine being a farmer and your son or your daughter or somebody sitting next to you and you say, I planted that seed, I know it's not going to grow. You know, it's going to be dead on arrival. I know, I know. It's just, it's going to go nowhere. It's going to go nowhere. You know, people speak like that and they say, what seed are you speaking about? And they're saying, I'm speaking about that seed I planted. Why are you confessing such negative things over your seed? Pour water on that seed of life. They say, yeah, I know the rats are going to eat my seed. I know, I'm not expecting much. I'm not expecting much. You know why? Because then I can't be disappointed. Get a life. That's not God. That's just negative people. Don't be part of them. Confess and speak water over your seed. Why? Because it's your harvest. Your seed is your harvest. You want that thing to multiply. And I'm not going to be too much longer. But the second one, third one is important. You know, you need to fertilize that seed. And you know what I call fertilizer? I call it F-I-T-H, faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak faith over that thing. That thing's only a puppy, but it's going to become a big dog soon. It's going to grow out of darkness in the soil, and it's going to see the light in the sky. Because I'm going to pray that thing through breakthrough. You know what's the critical part of any seed that grows? And I'm just using an analogy here, please. Uh, it, it's, it's that moment when the soil wants to hold on to it. <clears throat> the ground and the darkness is saying, you belong to me. And, and just, just before breakthrough, just before the light, there's that struggle where that seed needs one more push, one more little bit of fertilizer, and bang, it's through. And then it sees the sky as the limit. Do you know that that happens to every single seed in the ground? breakthrough. Just before it's the darkest, there is breakthrough, and that seed sees the light. And then, boy, it go, takes off, and it grows even more, because now the light is right on it. We need to fertilize that seed with faith. Give it some fertilizer. Let that thing grow, because it's a seed, and the inner seed is a harvest. And lastly, I want to say to you, call in that harvest. When you see that harvest, that seed breaking through, those seeds breaking through, you need to confess a hundredfold return. Okay, 50% return. Okay, I'll take 1% return for an amen. Or a thousand percent return. You have to, you have to, and I have to, we have to say, I'm going to, I'm going to call in the percentage. I want a hundredfold. I want a thousand. God's sitting there saying, it's your seed, you call it in. Say, no, Lord, I'll take one and one. I'll take 50%. He says, you've got 50%. Have I got 55%? Yes, you can have 55%. Now I've got 60%. Has, can I get 60%? God's the auctioneer, and he's saying, how much would you confess over that seed? I say, a thousand percent. God says, I've got a thousand percent. Will somebody give me a million percent? Yes, I've got a million percent. <laughs> God is not intimidated by my figures. He is saying, call it in. You planted it, you watered it, you fertilized it, now you call it in. Lastly, I want to read a scripture. Now, here's the question, Jack. Does God have a harvest for me? I feel there's some people here that you've wasted your harvest. You may have just destroyed your harvest. You made bad decisions like Judas. You sold and ate your harvest. Don't be discouraged. That's wrong, but don't be discouraged. Is there hope for you? 
Yes, yes, yes. There's definite hope for you. You know, maybe you made a mistake like I have and others have, but you know what? Tomorrow is a new day. God gives us. He's a mercy. Go and plant another seed. Go and plant five seeds. And, and then go water them, fertilize them. Yes, maybe it won't happen in one day in a week or seven days or seven weeks, but sooner than later, a harvest will come again. Start planting a harvest, even if you made a mistake. It's never, never, never too late because God is a merciful God and he will watch over our seed, but he also watches what we're going to do. Lastly, is there a harvest for me? What scripture? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10. I'll close with this. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, who gives us the ability to have a harvest? God, he gave us seed in our hand and bread for food will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. God is going to enlarge our harvest because he wants us to have a harvest. He wants us to see our harvest in our seed. He gave us the seed not because it was fraught. He gave it because it had potential to become a harvest. And so I want to encourage you this morning, in spite of what's happening in the world and many things are happening, don't take your eyes off what God has done and what he is doing. The harvest is ripe now. Send a message to somebody. Encourage them. Send your testimony. Send what God has done in your life. That's your powerful seed you've got. Share something with them that happened to you this last week or month or year. Tell them there's hope for them. Tell them God's not forgotten them. Write them a note and say, I, I was thinking about you today and I was reminded that God really loves you and he cares about your life. Go and share with them your favorite scripture. Go and share with them, not something to condemn them, but something to exhort them. Tell them it's never too late to give their life to Christ. Tell them that the Holy Spirit of God wants to fill their lives. Tell them that God has a, a plan that is supernatural for their lives, that they should not look at what people are saying, but they should read what God's saying and they'll get excited. That is really how we each one reach one and teach one. And that's how our harvest will come. Don't sit on the stoop like that dumb farmer and curse your seed. Don't sit there and do nothing and say, I can't plant it. I'm just going to shoot my seed into heaven and I'm going to give it all to God. No, 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 you're responsible, I'm responsible. We are co-laborers in this, 100% partners. We need to do something, plant it, we need to water it, we need to fertilize that seed, and then we need to call in our harvest. God bless you this morning as we pray. Pray a prayer of faith with me. Pray a declaration if you, you don't mind with me this morning. Let's refute the devil's words and negative words spoken over our lives, and let's declare God has said, because what God has said is written, not in stone, God's, what God has said is written in heaven eternally. That's what matters. Father, as we pray this morning, wherever we are here in this church, physically or we are watching, I pray that as we pray this prayer of declaration, we ask you this morning for a harvest, Father, in Jesus' name. We declare that our seed that you've given in our hands will grow. It will become a mighty harvest that we will call in because you said we are, Lord, the harvesters. You said, Jack, look, look up and see the fields are white unto harvest now. Father, we call in that harvest. If the enemy is trying to steal our harvest, we say this morning, the word of God is more powerful than the enemy. If people have laughed at us and said, you are working in vain, we say unto them, that may be your opinion, but we are doing this because we love God. If people have said that that's never going to happen in a lifetime, you say, well, it depends what lifetime you're thinking about because God's lifetime is now. And I want to say nothing is impossible. Say to yourself, nothing is impossible to them that believe. And I believe this morning. Jesus, I believe this morning. And I call you this morning to account for your work in my life. Come, Lord Jesus, and help me this morning as I ask you to come into my life to make the changes I need. Forgive me, Lord, for my unbelief and set me free from the limitations 
that I have set and others have set and the devil has set in my life. I feel released this morning because I believe. I want to say to you this morning, believe. God's got this. God bless you.